the reverts, the converts, the inverts, and D, all of the above. Um, we accept you wherever you are. Our policy is no condemnation, no criticism, no castigation. If anybody criticizes, come and tattletale on them and I will straighten them out. And I mean that. I don't want anybody to be criticized. We want to create a space where people can grow and people can be empowered in the faith. So if anyone starts pointing a finger, just remember that you have three pointing back to you. And if you have a, a thumb that points back like mine, you have four pointing back to you. So, um, we are in the blessed month of Sha'aban. It's a very special month in the Islamic calendar. It is the month when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fasted more than any other month except the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan will, inshallah, arrive within the day of the 28th of June. So, um, hopefully you're preparing your hearts and your spirits for this great and blessed month that you are making goals <coughs> the things that you want to achieve this Ramadan and it's my prayer for all of you that it will not be just another Ramadan and in the 27 years that I've been a Muslim I see people go through Ramadan after Ramadan after Ramadan and nothing different happens and that's a problem at the end of Ramadan you should be a different person you should have elevated spiritually the only reason you walk is because you didn't plan to if you fail to plan, your plan will fail. So if you have a plan and you write down your spiritual goals, these are the things I want to achieve, and these are the things that I want to carry out after the month of Ramadan, these are the things that I want to continue, this is how I want to refine my character, this is how I want to change my conditions. So inshallah you're all prepared and ready for this very special time that um, is about to arrive. The first Ramadan potluck will be July the 4th, and that will be at 8 p.m. You will get an invite. If you don't get an invite, please call Mason at this number, and she will make sure that you get all the invites and all the postings about our class. Now, you may look around and say, where is everybody? Well, a lot of our uh, students operate on Muslim Standard Time, and that means you get here about 30 minutes after the class starts. So, um, we collect non-perishables. If you can afford to bring one can of food or a bag of beans or something, we donate that to local food shelters. We also collect um, disposable ink cartridges and toners, and that helps raise money to continue to do dollar. Um, and also cell phones. If you have a cell phone that works, we don't need all the accoutrement, the cords, and all of that. We just need the phone. We have that phone um, converted to help victims of domestic violence, and that's something that is part of our vision. So if you have one on top of your refrigerator, or under the bed, or under the refrigerator, when you do your spring cleaning, get that phone and give it to us so we can make it um, good use out of it, inshallah. Who's here for the first time today at this class? Would you please stand up? I've been here before. I've been here a long time. After a long time, we're very really happy to have you, mashallah, with us. Would you guys please introduce yourself? I'm Abdel uh, Sveh. I'm from Saudi Arabia. It's my first time here. I'm coming here for studying the Quran and English. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. I'm not going to happen. Yes, and tell us who brought you to the class. Which one of our missionaries invited you? Sabria. Sabria. I think Sabria gets the gold star. I don't know how many people you have not brought to this class, Sabria. Everybody I've talked to. May Allah bless you um, and reward you and bless you guys and open your heart more and more to the light of Allah and Islam and help you with your English, inshallah. Inshallah. It'll be their first, inshallah, Ramadan away from mom. So, oh, well, it's going to be difficult. I have a big shoes to fill. Yes, you do. And would you please, you can sit down now, thank you very much. Would you please introduce yourself? My name is Fatima. I'm the first time here. Me and my husband, Alex, and he wants to learn, and he wants to learn more about Islam, and that's why we're here. Mashallah. So, Alex and I have been talking, and Alex didn't know that. 
I was a Christian minister before, so he wants to know about that transition. So we're, I'm looking forward to meeting with you and talking to you about that. And um, that's going to be great. Did I leave anybody out? And it's really good to see some faces that haven't been here for a while. I'm not sure a lot. Yes. Just, just a, um, he, I actually met Alex. He was a waiter at a restaurant that Rusty and I went to. That was me. And um, we just so happened to talk about Islam when we were there. And I gave him my card. And he remembers me telling him where the class was. So my first person coming to the class that I come to. <laughs> Okay, so we have been talking about the tafsir of Surah al -Bakr. And we we started, who remembers when we started the tafsir class? Does anybody remember? <laughs> we learned last time about 70 people who asked Musa alayhi salam that show us Allah and then they, they said that we will believe you. So Musa alayhi salam took those 70 people to the mountain, a poor mountain, and yes. then uh, when, because they insisted and then when uh, Allah showed, they <coughs> all uh, described the tunnel uh, on them, yes. uh, you know, and then they died. Then, uh, Musa, Allah, what should I do? Because they will say, there are those 70 people. You know yes. what to do. So when he came, Allah told him, when he came back, Allah raised them up all 70 people. Masha'Allah. You know, this is my old student. She doesn't mind if I say that because I... Um, old and gold. Old and gold. <laughs> old student. And, um, Ma Masha'Allah, you know, every week she remembers something from the week before and really she's such an example to us and I call her mommy, so don't misunderstand. She's not my birth mommy, but she's my spiritual mommy. So um, if you uh, mess with her or mess with me, she will get her cane off you. Yeah, yeah, cane. <laughs> Very good, big cane. I learned this first time in my life. I'm doing it. And I was so surprised that I didn't <coughs> understand how come I could not understand that there were 70 people. So I cursed myself and took it. No, don't curse yourself. We love yourself. Because we have to concentrate so that we are reading the meaning of the land. Well, I want to warn you that today I'm going to slow down. I want you to raise your hand if you have questions because it can be a little confusing today. Um, what, what we're going to begin to approach today, uh, or approach upon, sorry, is uh, a little confusing, but I'll try my very best to make this as simple as possible for you. Anybody else want to share something they learned last week? Don't everybody jump at the same time now. <laughs> okay, then we'll get started. Um, I just wanted to say, so you started to teach the Tafsir, uh, sort of March, there was in mid-March we started Tafsir, and we are actually at verse two, uh, verse 58 of the second chapter of the Holy Quran. That means that we have covered about 61 verses in that much time, and that's how much detail we talk about in terms of Tafsir. So hold on to your seat, grab your reins, because you may need it. We do cover a lot of information, and we do cover it in a lot in great detail. So. Um, it's, it's been such a blessing to me. When I um, taught this before in the prison setting, and I wasn't in prison by the way, because I was a chaplain there. I just don't want to get the wrong message out. But when I taught it before, um, reteaching it has just brought so many things to life for me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has really blessed me and um, so Allah's continual mercy to the disobedient and ungrateful Israelites. And at the end of the lecture today, I'm going to talk to you about some of the misunderstandings today when we talk about the people of the book and some of the things that we hear which are really not founded in Islam. We love the people of the book. And I'm teaching you about a historical reference of the Israelites at, a, at this particular time in history. It is not general statements. 
that apply to every Jewish person in the world. It applied to these particular people at this time in the Holy Quran. In Surah 2 and verse 58, and remember when we said, enter this town, Jerusalem, and eat bountifully therein with pleasure and delight wherever you wish. And enter the gate in prostration or bowing with humility and surrender and say, forgive us. And we shall forgive you your sins and shall increase reward for the good doers. But those who did wrong changed the word from that which had been told to them for another. So we sent upon the wrongdoers rigzag, a punishment from the heaven because of their rebellion. I want you to take a moment. How many commands can we find in this one verse for the, the Israelites at that time? What's the first one? Enter into the town. Okay, so the first one's enter in this town. What's the next one? So I'm just going to put enter town, eat. All right, what's next? Prostrate. Prostrate. I really should have been an opera. Look how I like. No offense, no offense. <laughs> I uh, ask for forgiveness. Anything else? And that's it. Okay. So keep this in mind because as I mentioned what various scholars say, we're going to go back and forth from these things and looking at the past here. Okay? From the law. According to Shah Abdul Qadr, when the Israelites grew weary of this gift of man and salwa, every day they prayed for the food they used to have. And this is one opinion. And then in Surah 2, 61, and we will come back to verse 60, by the way. I'm not going to leave verse 60 out. But there's a reason that I'm sort of running in this chronology. And remember when you said, oh, Musa, we cannot endure one kind of food. So invoke your Lord for us to bring forth for us of what the earth grows, its herbs, its cucumber, its fume. And that herbs, by the way, is not the stuff they smoke nowadays. <laughs> its lentils and its onions. He said, would you exchange that which is better for that which is lower? Go you down to any town and you shall find what you want. So I also want you to focus on this verse when he says, Go ye down to any town, because there's going to be some discrepancies among the scholars about which town that is. So I just want to share that with you as well. So don't be surprised when you see that later. As was seen in verse 58, they were commanded to go to Jerusalem, where they could get what they wished for. In Shah's view, the commandment in the verse pertains to the mode of entering the city. So how did they say it? They said, enter the town, eat, and prostrate. Right? Yes. Right? Very good. So in his view, this verse is about how to enter the city and lays down the spiritual etiquette for actions. What was the etiquette? With humility and submission and surrender, okay? For action and speech on the occasion. I forgot prostration. Prostration is sujud. Yes. When we go into sujud. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, yeah. The other opinion is that the commandment pertains to the city which the Israelites had been ordered to engage themselves in jihad. Do you remember we talked about this last week? Yes. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Thank you, Furiel. They obeyed it only after their long wandering in the wilderness wilderness, and conquered the city. How long were they in the wilderness? Forty years. Forty years, right. What did we learn about the wilderness? It was barren. Did they have clothes? No. Did they get clothes? No. Yes, they did eventually. Yeah. And what do we know about those clothes that Allah gave them? They grew with them. They grew with them. This was like one of the Mu'ajizah. Um, so as the youth 
You know, if you've ever had boys in about the 6th or 7th grade, they grow 7 inches in one year, well, their clothes would actually grow with them. So you could buy a pair of Levi's, you could buy a 28 length, and when they got to a 32 length, the jeans would grow with them. That would be pretty neat. But that was one of the more I just for these people. That their clothes actually grew with them. And their clothes, guess what else? One of the miracles, their clothes remain clean. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, by a lot. In this opinion, the commandment was sent to them through Sayyidina Yusha, I have the hardest time with that, or Joshua in English, who was the prophet among them at the time. The discrepancy between these two views raise a question about the chronological sequence of the events, but should not confuse us to the nature of the story. So as you always hear me say, what is the essence of the story? Um, you're going to find that another prophet is introduced, perhaps some of the verses were revealed, and then a few were revealed, and this is where they ended up, and then some more were revealed, and went back to a different prophet. So I don't want you to be confused, but I want you to get the essence of the story, inshallah. The intention here is to draw conclusions from the story and illustrate spiritual principles. The verse holds out the promise that if the Israelites obeyed the commandment, the errors would be forgiven. Did you see that? Did everybody see that? We will repeat this and we will review this in the class today, inshallah. But I just want to keep setting the foundation because there is a lot of material in today's lecture and I want to make sure I don't miss anything and you don't miss anything, inshallah. In Shah's view, one must include among their errors the rejection of the man and the soul. Remember when the Israelites said, oh my God, can't we have the food that we were missing from Egypt? You know, can't we have something besides this man and this sawa, uh, these, this quail and this these melon? You know, one uh, tapsir says melon, one says it's quail. And what was the other thing? Well, that's the biblical portion, since it's like bread. And I just had a brain freeze, and it's just not coming to me. Right? It'll, maybe it'll come to me in a minute. Is it manna? But there's one other thing. What was it, brother? Manna? What's the yeah. Manna? What, but what, what was the man? What did I teach you it was? Oh, what did you say? Truffles. Truffles. Yes, that's one scholar. Truffles. That's what I was looking for. Thank you, sister. Another one of my great students. Michelle. So, though the man was insolent, presumptuous, and insulting in manner and speech, arrogant and audaciously rude. I didn't make any judgments there, did I? Allah promised that if they showed their obedience by following the new commandment, He would forgive this error too. What does that say to us in our day and time? Speak up, sister. That God is forgiving, yes. But what do we have to do? Be obedient. We have to be obedient. We can't say, well, I know the Quran says this, but. Because that means as soon as we say the but, what are we doing? Negating. We're negating it. We're contradicting. We're rebelling. Um, we're rejecting the truth. That's what that means. The promise of pardon was general and extended to everyone who was ready to obey the new commandment. While a special reward was promised to those who devoted themselves to good deeds Sincerity, or sincerely and wholeheartedly. Now, I want to. I'm going to talk about the word musanun, musanun for a moment here. The word for good doers. The root of that word is hisan. And I want to talk about that because that is the goal of every family member here: is to reach spiritual hisan. And I translate that to mean spiritual perfection. So often, someone will ask me in the class, is it allowed to do this? Is it allowed to do that? And I will say, it is allowed to do this, and it is allowed to do that, but the best practice is this. So I will give an example. How many of you have heard me do that? How many times? Don't even go there. But many, many times. So Islam often points out a best practice and an alternative practice. You know, it's allowed to do this, but then there's always this best practice. So, we are always trying to reach perfection, and here's a great example of that. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that he spent his lifetime perfecting his prayer. 
And this was the beloved prophet. This is the Esan that I want you to understand. That here was a perfect man, but he spent his lifetime perfecting just a Salah. And think about it. How hard do we work to try to perfect our Salah? To, when we stand, to make sure we stand in Qiyam, and that we don't think of anything else except the law. To make sure that when we bow, when we bow in Rukua, that we are still in that shape of the lamb, the letter lamb in Arabic. Because you know that when we pray, we spell the name of Allah. This is Aleph, this is Lamb, and when we do in the Sujud, that looks like Hat. So we actually spell Allah with our body when we surrender to Allah. So if you, that is real picture of submission. But trying to perfect that in the sense that you're still in every single piece of that. That you are praying with Kishur, with presence of heart. That is you, every time we move from position to position in prayer, what do we say almost every time? Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than anything I can think of. Allah is greater than any distraction in this prayer. Allah is greater than anything. So we stand and we say, Allahu Akbar. We put the world behind us and we stand before Allah naked. Because He's the all-seer and the all-knower. And we say, Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greater. The very greatest. And we bow and we say, Allahu Akbar. So we're always reminding ourselves that Allah is the greatest. So sincerity and wholeheartedness are weak English renderings for the essential quality of the text Musani Nun, good doers, found in Surah 2 and verse 58. And remember when we said, enter this town, Jerusalem, and eat bountifully therein with pleasure, and delight whatever you wish, and enter the gate in prostration, or bowing with humility and saying, forgive us, and we shall forgive you your sins, and shall increase reward for the good doers. If you want to increase your good rewards, folks, what do you need to be according to this verse? You need to be a good doer. You need to be humble. You need to be obedient. You need to be sincere. You need to have a class. And that's the sort of essence of, and the beauty of this verse, what it's saying to us in modern day times. That Allah has made a promise at the very end of this verse that our sins will be forgiven and our rewards will be increased if we are obedient, if we are the doers of good. And that's a pretty powerful promise. The word comes from Isan, Musinun Isan, you see the root there, signifies doing something beautifully in the manner that is proper to it. Isan has a technical meaning defined in Ahadith. Offer your prayer as if you can see him, Allah. And if you do not see him, he is seeing you in any case. The all-seer and the all-knower is watching you, listening to your supplications to him. Listening to you say, Allah, who act well. Watching you be obedient and waiting to render reward for that. In verse 59, But those who did wrong changed the word which had been told to them for another. So what we're going to find is that they were told certain words to say when they entered the city. We'll see that in a few minutes. And I'm going to show you all of the different forms of that word that scholars say they changed it. So bear with me and I want you to just be warned that I'm going to be giving you a few ideas about this so that you'll be aware of it before I even get there. Allah had commanded them to keep repeating the word Hittatun. Hittatun. While entering the city as a manner of repentance for their sins and asking for pardon. Now, I have a few Arabs folks in here. If I change the Kisra after the Ha to a Fatha, we change the definition, right? We change the word, right? If I said Hattatun, Instead of hit that tune, it would mean something completely different, right? Right? 
Okay, you'll be, you'll be with me in a minute. You guys will get me in a minute. All right, I'm good luck. They replaced the word hitatun with another phrase by way of mockery and started saying habbatun fi shat il. Grain in the midst of barley. Or hitatatun, or grain in the midst of wheat. So remember how over and over and over again they were complaining and they would ask Allah, Allah would give them what they asked for and then they would complain again. And then they would rebel. And on and on and on they would. And Allah kept forgiving them. The punishment for their disobedience was plague that wiped out 70,000 men. This punishment is something important for us to pay attention to. Because they change the word that Allah told them to say. And it's so easy to change a word if we look at it in the context of the Arabian. Because if you change this the vowel, you change the complete meaning. And unintentionally, I've done that many times because of my weakness in Arabic. May Allah forgive me and um, help me. So, the Israelites were punished for changing a word ordained by Allah. <clears throat> There's a lot of hidden meaning in this because we don't change the words in Arabic because many of us don't know Arabic. But how do we change the words? We say, I don't think the Quran means that. I know it says that, but. Isn't that changing a word? Yes. Yes. The Israelites were rebellious instead of appreciative when they gained victory. Allah admonished the Jews for avoiding jihad and not entering the Holy Land as they had been ordered to do when they came from Egypt with Musa salam. They were also commanded to fight the disbelieving Amalek, the Canaanites, dwelling in the Holy Land at that time. But they did not want to fight because they were weak and exhausted. Allah punished them by causing them to become lost, and they continued wandering, as Allah has stated in Surah Umayyadah, Surah 5 and verse 21, and of course we know they wandered for 40 years. The correct opinion, according to one scholar, the Holy Land mentioned here, is that it was Beit Omakis in Jerusalem, As-Sudi, Arabi bin Anas, Qutada, and Abu Muslim al as Fahani, as well as others, have stated, Musa said in Surah 5 and verse 21, O people, enter the Holy Land, which Allah has assigned to you, and turn not back in flight. However, some scholars said that the Holy Land here is Jericho. Ariha'a. Did I say that right in Arabic? Or Jericho? Is it? Is this I said it right. I said it right. Just like I just want to make sure. I like to make sure I can correct you. And this opinion was mentioned from Ibn Abbas and Abdullah Man bin Zayd. So what are the two opinions? Could it be Jerusalem or? Yes, or Jericho. Okay? Alhamdulillah. So if you hear people, and the reason I like to cover this particularly for the reverts, is so that if you hear somebody in a khutbah one day say Jericho, and you hear somebody say Jerusalem, say Alhamdulillah, Imam Sykes taught me that that is the two opinions. So now I know. Alhamdulillah. Don't go argue with the Imam. Just two opinions, <laughs> alright? Alhamdulillah. After the years of wandering, wandering ended, 40 years later, in the company of Joshua bin Nun, Allah allowed the children of Israel to conquer the Holy Land on the eve of a Friday. On that day, the sun was kept from setting for a little more time until victory was achieved. When the children of Israel <coughs> conquered the Holy Land, they were commanded to enter its gate while prostrating in appreciation to Allah for making them victorious, triumph, returning them to their land and saving them from being lost and wandering. al Afi said that Ibn Abbas said that and entering the gate, Sujadin, which comes from, what would be the root of Sujadin? Sujud. Sujud, very good, mashallah. 
means while bowing. Ibn Jarir reported Ibn Abbas saying, and entered the gate in prostration. Now let me ask you a question before you read on. Do you think you could enter a gate of a city, a bunch of people, in Sidhu? No. Can you move in Sidhu? No. Because no. that would disrupt your prayer, right? So what do you think might be the meaning here? We are free thinkers in Islam. We are allowed to think. Allah knows best. We always say that at the end. But what do you think it means? To be humble. To be humble. To be in submission. To bow down in obedience to Allah. To surrender to Allah. So let's look at some opinions. Bowling. Through a small door while bowing, Al-Hakim narrated it, and Ibn Abi Hatim added, and they went through the door backwards. Al-Hasan al-Basri said that they were ordered to prostrate on their faces when they entered the city. But Ar-Razi discounted this explanation. It was also said that the sujood mentioned here means submissiveness. For actually entering while prostrating, of course, is not possible. So if you hear imams sharing these different opinions, you'll say, yeah, I already knew that. My teacher taught me that. And say, alhamdulillah, Allah knows best. Right? Allah always knows best. But I want you to hear all the opinions. Every opinion I can give you, I'm going to give you. Everything I've ever learned, I'm going to try to pour it into you. And then you must pour it into someone else, inshallah. Kasif said that Iqrima said that Ibn Abbas said, that sounds like nowadays, right? So and so said that so and so said that so and so said that so and so said. And we call this what? The chain of transmission, right? Very good. The door mentioned here was facing the Qibla. Ibn Abbas, Mujahid, Asudi, Qutada, and Adaha said that the door is the door of Hitta. And, and I need your help on this, brother. Is Jerusalem? Ilya. Ilya. How would you say it in Arabic? Jerusalem? Yes. Quds. Quds. Yeah, that's what I know. But this but in this the old language said Orshalim. Okay, well this this is what's recorded in the different tafsir. And I'm not sure how that's supposed to be pronounced. I looked it up, I tried to Google it, and I could not find um, a breakdown of the phonetic pronunciation of this, but I wanted you to see it as it's seen in case you see it again. You can say, well, I saw it before. Very good. Arazi also reported that some of them said that it was a door in the direction of the Qibla. Kasif said that Iqrima said that Ibn Abbas said that the children of Israel entered the door sideways. Asudi said that Abu Sayyid al-Azdi said that Abu al-Kundud, Tanud, sorry, said that Abdullah bin Masud said that they were commanded to enter the gate in prostration or bowing in humility. But instead they entered while their heads were raised in defiance. To this day, whenever we hear the term arrogance, what is the posture that we visualize in our mind? Someone walking with their head up? Some people walking with their head up. A little proud, right? <laughs> we call it cocky rocky in modern day terms. <laughs> I guess you have to be from North Carolina to get that. Okay. Allah said next and say Hitta. Ibn Abbas commented, seek Allah's forgiveness. Al-Hassan and Qutada said that it means, say, relieve us from our errors. So, again, Allah made an order. Allah knows best exactly what was said, but what do we know? Allah made an order, right? Verse 58. And if you follow my order, if you obey me, and we shall forgive you your sins and shall increase reward for the good doers. Here is the reward for fulfilling Allah's commandment. This ayah means if you implement what we commanded you, we will forgive your sins and multiply your good deeds. This is the key, folks. The key is not to learn all of this stuff in this class 
and say, oh wow, that was really interesting stuff. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah, wow, that was amazing. I, I never knew that the lightning did this, and I never knew this, and I didn't. But to implement the essence of what Allah is teaching in these verses. Because Rasulullah did not teach the companions more until they practiced what he had taught them. So if I implement that model, it means that as your teacher, I expect you to be practicing the two or three verses that we learn every week. The essences of those verses, implementing them in your life, inshallah. And while the red box is going around, let me just say thank you to everyone. Um, every dollar that you put in there, $5, $10, $100, $1,000, $10,000, $10, whatever you put in, goes to do dawah. And we've given away 400, and how many Qurans this year? My wife's looking it up. We try to keep a number, but I think it's 423. 434. 434. It's the dyslexia sitting in. Turning those numbers back. <laughs> so 434, mashallah. Thank you all that you helped participate in that to raise the money so that we can get out and, and, and donate these Qurans. In summary, upon achieving victory, the children of Israel were commanded to submit to Allah in tongue and deed, and to admit to their sins and seek forgiveness for them. And the same thing is applicable for us today. A lot of people think that we just say, oh, Allah, please forgive me for this. Astaghfirullah. I mean, that's the most famous word in the Islamic world. Astaghfirullah. And of course, it's said with all kinds of condemnation. But if we ourselves are asking for Allah to forgive us, what do we have to do? We have to correct. We have to have sincere repentance in our heart. We have to have remorse for what we've done. And we must correct the wrong action by introducing good deeds. Correct deeds. Amend means repent and amend. That's the, yes, repent and amend. Not just repent. And if you are in certain religions, somebody else did that all for you. But in our religion, that's not the case. So you must repent and you must amend. Very important. And what will happen? 